So this is the Grand Telescopio Canarius, the great telescope of the Canary Islands, and I'm about to have a look inside with a few people. It is the largest telescope on the mountain. It's sort of a copy of the Keck telescopes in Hawaii. So it's actually uh, uh, not quite a clone, but it's, they started from the, the design for the Keck telescopes and essentially used that to reproduce another telescope. But it was to, to, for the, it's a, a, basically a Spanish telescope and it was really so that Spain could have a, a, a really large telescope to use. So we have to put on a hard hat. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a very big head. My head is very big. We need the biggest possible one. <laughs> Look at that. So we're in this enormous dome. And actually, you can see, if you look on the ground, it's on this big disc, which is used to rotate the telescope when it's in use. And something else I find interesting is, inside these domes, they try to keep the air the same temperature as outside. And quite often with telescopes, just the big shutter up there, you see the shutter at the top of the dome, that's the air coming in there is enough to keep the dome cool but that also means the air comes in and out of the dome through the shutter which you're looking through and that's no good so what they've done here you see all these rows of windows there's one there there's also rows down here at this level all these windows all those windows like that can be opened to let the cool air in so the dome's nice and cool the same as outside and the air's not only using the shutter as the way in and out uh, so one of the, the annoying things in, in astronomy is that images of things in the sky get messed up by the atmosphere as the light comes down to us. Relatively late on it was realised that actually quite a lot of that messing up of the images was occurring very close to the ground itself. And in particular some of it was even happening inside the dome of the telescope. Um, and really the main issue is if things aren't in complete thermal equilibrium you end up with kind of eddy currents and things. If you, if you ever have a fire and you look at the air directly above the fire you can see everything is kind of shimmering. And that's really just because of the, the, the heat from the, the fire is, is messing up the atmosphere, creating these kind of turbulence. Same thing goes on inside a telescope dome. If the, the telescope or the ground it's on or whatever is not at the same temperature as the air above it, you end up creating these turbulent effects. So what you want to do is you want to get everything into thermal equilibrium as quickly as possible. You want the telescope to be the same temperature as the air, to be the same temperature as the ground and so on. And so we've done quite a lot of things now to try and, and make that happen as quickly as possible so we don't waste time. So for example, quite a lot of telescope domes now, the floor is actually refrigerated. They actually use that to bring the, the floor down to the same temperature as the air, keep it in, in equilibrium with the air. But of course, a, a relatively simple way of doing this is just have plenty of airflow through the telescope so that you take away any air that's warmed up, you bring the cooler air in, everything just reaches thermal equilibrium that bit sooner. So these shutters are really just to get a good airflow through the telescope so that everything ends up in thermal equilibrium. So the light comes in the shutter, and then it comes down to the mirror. The mirror is just, see those dark pieces there? There, there's one. See those dark pieces? They make up the mirror. There are 36 of those pieces, and they're all combined together to make this 10.4 meter diameter mirror. People have tried very hard and come up with very clever ways of building mirrors up to about eight meters in diameter. Incredibly hard work to do, but you can just about do it. But that really is pretty much the limit of a monolithic mirror, a single mirror. And so if you want to build a telescope that's any bigger than that, you actually end up building not a single mirror, but a segmented mirror, a mirror that's made up of lots of individual segments. So the, the Grand Tucan telescope is, is one of these segmented mirrors. It's a whole set of hexagonal segments that all together uh, are arranged to form the kind of the single mirror of the primary. So 10.4 metres, that is massive, that is a huge mirror, one of the world's biggest. So the light comes in through the shutter, which is closed at the moment, hits that big mirror, and then actually it bounces back up to that thing there. That's the secondary mirror. The light hits the secondary mirror, and then it bounces back down. I'll show you what it hits next. <laughs> it bounces back down and goes into that black tube there. And then the light can actually go off to this side or it can go off to the other side into the instruments where the measurements are made. This is, I cannot tell you how big this thing is. You really have to be here. I've also just been warned not to step on the disc there that the telescope's mounted on because that's actually floating on oil. And if I step on that, it will actually move the telescope. 
and at the moment they're working on the mirror and uh, if they're working on the mirror and then I shake it by stepping on the disc that will make me incredibly unpopular. There's a better view of the shutter now. That's the shutter. My hat fell off. <laughs> There's actually desks under the telescope on the disc. <laughs> desks with computers. I took a great photo of this telescope the other night. There was a cloud hovering above it for hours. So they're letting us go up these stairs now so we can look at the telescope from up a bit higher. There's the astronomers posing for pictures with the telescope. Even astronomers are impressed by this. Okay, so we're up a level now. We're on this walkway. You can see we're on a walkway around the dome. Got a better view of the secondary mirror now. And we're almost up at the same level as the primary mirror. The mirror that's made of those segments. But we're still not quite high enough to look down on the mirror. And there's those areas on the side where the instruments get mounted. And if I go here, you can sort of see a bit better now how when the light comes from the secondary mirror, it comes down there and then can shoot off to the side. You can even see where it comes out, see? So they've given me the okay. I'm gonna walk all the way around the walkway. So we're underneath one of the sides where those instruments get mounted. They can put some huge instruments on here. If you're used to telescopes being those small things in people's backyard, think again. Oh, now look here. From here, we've got a nice view of where the light goes into the instruments. See, it's come down and then gone in there. Looking down there as well, we've got a nice view of, the, of that disc floating on oil that the telescope's on. Again there, we're sort of seeing those segments that are put together to make the mirror. 36 of them. Each single one of those 36 would be a dream for most astronomers. And I've got 36 of them to make this combined 10.4 metre diameter. I'm glad I'm wearing my hard hat, but I think if this fell on me, I don't know, it would do me much good. And there's me, bit of a tourist shot with the telescope. I'm, I've never been in the dome. I've been there, obviously it's taken a number of years, so I've watched the dome kind of coming up from the ground and so on. So I've, I've watched it growing up, um, but one of these days I really must get inside and have a look around. You can just watch the video. <laughs> there she is from the outside. You can see those windows I was talking about. So there's the shadow of the dome. And check out that view. There are various things that you need to think about when you're sighting a telescope. One is, for example, you want a nice dark sight. But of course, on the other hand, you don't want to be too much in the middle of nowhere because you've got to get people out there, you've got to get electricity there and so on. So the, there's lots of trade-offs. One of the trade-offs is that, that you need people around in order for actually there to be enough infrastructure to build a telescope, but not too many people around so that the, the night sky is nice and dark. But one of the other issues is obviously one of the good things about being up a mountain is you're above clouds and so on. But if you build up a mountain in the middle of a mountain range, typically the air will have gone over the tops of other mountains before it gets to your mountain. And one of the things that happens to air, you know, air typically starts flowing in a nice laminar way, nice smooth flow. When it encounters a mountain top, it becomes very turbulent. And so if you're kind of on one of these downstream mountain tops, you end up with all this turbulent air from the other mountains going over your head. And turbulent air creates this phenomenon of seeing, which messes up the image quality of what you can actually see in the sky. So the perfect peak, as far as an astronomer is concerned, is a peak which is on its own. And that's why islands are so perfect, because you've got all this ocean around them, which means that the air has had plenty of time to calm down and be in this nice, smooth, laminar flow. And then there aren't other mountains around which will have messed up the, the airflow over your mountain. So that's why so many of the premier observatories like La Palma and Hawaii are mountains, high mountains, but that are isolated in the middle of the ocean. Not bad, Javier. Oh, yeah. Not bad. Not bad, not bad. It's, uh... It's quite big. <laughs> I still prefer that one over there. You prefer that's, those ones? Yeah, that's my preferred one. That's the William Herschel telescope. That's right. That's part of the Isaac Newton group of telescopes that Javier works for. Yep. But, but that's not bad either. That's not bad. We're so high up here that you're normally above the clouds. And that's a good thing when you're doing astronomy. Look at them. They're astronomers being tourists. They love it taking their photos. At night they take photos of space, but they can't take a photo of themselves for toffee. 
getting the sunlight, boys. And next to the telescope, they have all these levels here. This was actually used for the inauguration of the telescope, and all the VIPs were sitting here. Not a bad view they had, hey? You'd think all the telescopes up here have pretty much the same view, but actually, each site has slightly different seeing conditions. They actually chose between that site there and this site here. And they must be oh, only a couple of hundred metres apart, maybe 300 metres. But all the testing they did showed the seeing conditions here were ever so slightly better than the seeing conditions just over there, which is actually a little bit higher. The other irritating thing is that things vary with time. So what's a beautiful site one year will turn out to be a rubbish site for the next 10 years, which means that if you're not really careful with your site testing, you can fool yourself into thinking this is the perfect place for my telescope, but you just happen to have caught it, done your site testing in the one year where that was the perfect place. And for the next 10 years, it turns out you'd have been better off 100 yards up the road. Here's another interesting fact. I was saying before how important it is to keep the telescope dome cold. And over the years, they've realized one of the most important things to do is keep heat sources away from the dome. Don't build anything that generates heat near the dome. And that's why in modern telescopes like this, all the engines and heating stuff's right over there, far away as possible from the dome. I, I grew up in London, and so actually, I, I had rarely seen the night sky at its best. Until I went to start going to professional astronomical observatories, I'd never seen the Milky Way. Um, and so going out in a place like La Palma in the middle of the night and just looking at the sky and seeing this band of light across the sky. I, sometimes the Milky Way is so bright, I swear I can see my shadow from the Milky Way. It really is that impressive across the sky. And I've been out there for some of the meteor showers. A few years ago, I was out there where one of the big comets was flying across the sky and you could see this tail of this comet across maybe a third of the sky. It was so dark. It's absolutely beautiful. And you know, you do, you often find, if you go observing with professional astronomers, we're pretty blasé about the night sky, but nonetheless you'll find that you know, once or twice a night we'll sneak out just to have a look at the sky because it is so gorgeous.